1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Lord's good, even when we're not. He loves us, but we don't love Him. And he's faithful, but we're not. 1 Peter 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again, uh, new birth, second birth, born again, unto a lively hope at the, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, we've begotten to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, that faith not away, reserved in heaven for you. You, <clears throat> you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, and we should do so, and greatly rejoice in this great salvation and this uh, inheritance that's awaiting us and all that, he said, you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be. Indicating sometimes uh, these things are needed. You are in heaviness through manifold temptations, various different temptations, that the trial, here's the purpose, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than a gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, God, that you do love us. You are faithful to us. God, forgive us for our unfaithfulness many times. Lord, help us to strive for that faithfulness, to be right with you at all times. Serve you. Walk in the light, not walk in the, in the flesh. And Lord, you said here that uh, sometimes there's trials come to come our way. And the purpose is to build our faith Make us what you want us to be. Mold us into what you'd have us to be. God, help us to see that and see uh, the wherefores of all that. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, the jewelers will tell you that the surest test to find if a diamond is genuine or not is what they call a water test. And what you do, you take a diamond and put it in water, and it'll still be brilliant. You can take a fake diamond glass and put it in the water, and it'll disappear. Put a piece of glass in the water. You put the fake and the real side by side in the water, then it's, it's evident to everybody which is the genuine and which is not. And sometimes God, he says here, uh, he says if need be, sometimes God has to put us into some hot water to check out the reality. To see if we're real with him, if we're genuine, if we're what we're supposed to be. In fact, he told Israel back there before they went through their wilderness journey that uh, he was going to take them through there to prove them whether they would stay right with God or not. Now God, he, he already knows, you know, he knows what we're made of, he knows what we're going to do, he knows what our reaction is going to be in any given situation, but he wants us to know that, he wants our heart to be aware of our relationship with the Lord and whether or not we are, uh, we are close to him and trusting him and having the faith like we ought to have uh, with him. And so, um, generally, our faith is okay as long as there's no hot water, as long as there are no trials. But when they come on us and sometimes they get dumped on it, you know, the world says things happen in threes. Well, sometimes they happen more than that. And uh, that's when our faith really gets tested. Whether we're going to stay with the Lord, whether we're going to give up, you know, get uh, disgruntled or murmur and complain to the point we're just going to throw in the towel and quit. Say, I'd never do that. But don't say I'd never do that. Multitudes of Christians have done that. So it's a, it's a moment by moment thing, a trial by trial thing to see if we're going to stay with the Lord in a given situation. Personally, I believe he elevates the, uh, he escalates the degree of the trials as we grow in the Lord. You know, what was a problem for you 10 years ago might not even bother you today. So we might have to make something else along the way to help mature our faith a little bit. A little bit more. So today we're going to look at the manner of testing our faith, how God goes about it, what's involved, and so on like that. Look at chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is, notice that, is to try you. He didn't say it might happen, he said it's going to happen. As though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, 
that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. That is, glad you went through the trial with the Lord, you stayed faithful to him, you didn't get sidetracked and so on by the difficulties that were showing up in your life. So let's just look at the various ways this takes place, the manner of testing our faith for a few minutes this morning. Number one, there's divine trials. Trials that come directly from God himself. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth, that's, that's more difficult than chastening, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Amen. So God, if you become his child, he's going to take you to the woodshed every once in a while and, um, uh, in order to increase your faith. And it doesn't mean you did something wrong. Job did nothing wrong. God put him through the ringer, let the devil do it. Uh, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Uh, you ever tell a kid, well, you know, you just, you just need that every once in a while to keep you right. <laughs> so that's, that's the way God does with his kids sometimes, I think. Um, and so it doesn't mean when you have a trial come your way. You know, first question a lot of Christians have, well, what in the world did I do wrong? Well, maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe just God's just going to test you out a little bit. See if you're going to do right under the pressure. Uh, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, he said, God says, Behold, I have refined thee. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Now, they don't do it that way today because it's all mechanized and all that, but used to with gold, they say that the goldsmith would put the gold in a little cauldron, whatever it was, and he did, and he would keep looking at that thing until he could see his own reflection in it. That's when he knew it was pure gold. I don't know how true that is, but that's what you'll read about the way they uh, used to do those kind of things. But God said, I've refined thee, I've chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. He chose you in the furnace, that's where the fire is, of affliction. If we never, never had any trials in life, you would never know if God keep his promises to you or not. Amen. You never would know. In Zechariah 13, verse 9, God says, I will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. It's tried in the fire. It's tried in the heat. And God said, I'm going to refine you the same way. I'm going to put you through the heat. Uh, put some, turn up the burners on you every once in a while and just see if you're going to come through. What did Job say? He said, when I'm tried, I'll come, come forth as what? Gold. Come forth as gold. I'll be purified. Uh, read about Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You ever think you're going through too much and God's put too much on you? Read what Paul went through. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He catalogs all the stuff he went through. And none of us have been through that degree of uh, things that uh, Paul went through. <clears throat> and the Lord encouraged us that uh, he went through it so we can also. Acts 16 verse 23. Paul, it says when, when they had laid many stripes upon them. as Paul and Silas. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison. What not just to beat them up? <clears throat> We're going to lock them up in the dungeon as well. He went through all kinds of trials. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 32, he said if what he was preaching wasn't true, then why in the world was he going through what he was going through? Good question. <clears throat> if Jesus is not real, why do you go through the things you go through? But he is real. 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about if, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our faith is vain, and so on and so on. And then verse 20 down there, it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead. So there's no uh, nothing vain about it at all. And so uh, if, as long as uh, we're trusting the Lord, He gives us through the fire, He gives us through the crucible, He gives us through the furnace of affliction, as He talked to Israel there, and all those kind of things, brings us through those trials. Our faith is being tested. It's being put to the test. And, uh, of course, the, again, the Lord knows. He knows what you're made of, but He wants you to know. He wants me to know. He wants us to know how weak our faith is. Amen. How lack of trust we have in the Lord. And puts us through those trials sometimes so we get the point and, and turn ourselves more over, <clears throat> over to Him. <coughs> First Corinthians 15, verse 30, Paul said his life was in jeopardy every hour. Well, yours is not. Mine's not. <clears throat> he gets in jeopardy once in a while, but not, not every hour. What are some of the ways God tries us? He'll try us through sacrifice. That's what he did with Abraham. He said, I want you to take your son, Genesis 22, your only son Isaac, and offer him a burnt offering <clears throat> unto the Lord. Now, that's, that's horrible. That's hideous. And that's what God said, I want you to do. I want you to burn your son. I want you to kill your son burn him to a crisp. Sacrifice. So sometimes God will use sacrifice in order to get our attention. He'll take something away from us. 
or tell us to put something down that, that means something special to us because if we're not careful, it becomes an idol to us and comes between us and God. So sometimes he'll try us through sacrifice, sometimes through bereavement. That's what he did with David and his infant son. The Bible says David, uh, um, what, 2 Samuel chapter 11, spent seven days in prayer and fasting uh, if God would please heal his infant son. Well, God didn't. The son died. And the Bible says God, uh, David got up and went to, the, went to the altar and worshiped the Lord. And sometimes God will use bereavement to get our attention. Sometimes somebody real close to us will die. And how are we going to react? I tell you, I'm impressed with Brother Woody's attitude and his wife's attitude with what they're going through right now. And she's on her deathbed with cancer, and they're both looking at it as, you know, it's okay if this is if, if God wants her home, that's okay. Um, how would you how would you accept something like that? Bereavement sometimes. Sometimes it's just loss. You look at Job, and one day he lost his wealth. He lost his livelihood. He lost his business. He lost most of his servants. Uh, and even the, the, uh, his wife standing with him in the situation, she said, why don't you just curse God and die? This is all over. And then in the next few days, he loses the confidence of his friends. They all turn against him. So he lost his health. That, that was taken away. And all that took place in just a matter of, of days. The whole business there in the book of uh, Job. But listen, all three of those guys passed the test. Abraham passed it, David passed it, and Job passed it, and you can pass it, and I can pass it. Amen. If they can, we can. Exodus 20, verse 20, <clears throat> Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, to put you to the test, that you sin not. And he's come here to prove us as well in our daily life. The Lord's around to prove us. Now, uh, there's one good thing about the refiner. He stays close to the furnace the whole time that the metal is being refined. So nothing will go wrong. He stays close to uh, his, when he has his gold in the fire. And the Lord stays close as well. In fact, if we can use it as an illustration, he's in the fire with you when you're there. Remember the three Hebrews back there in Daniel chapter 6? Put three in there, and the king says, I see four in there. One's like the Son of Man, the Son of God. Well, that's who he was, the Son of God walking in there with him. And he'll walk in there with us. So sometimes there's divine trials. Things come our way, and God engineered it on purpose to, to build our faith and so on. And then there are what we might call demanding tasks. Okay, things that really put the pressure on us that we have to do. Good example of that's Nehemiah. You read back the book of Nehemiah. The, he surveyed the, the wall. It was all, all rubble. Uh, the wall of Jerusalem and so forth, and uh, God wanted him to build that wall back, and as they go to moving the rubble away, if you read back there, it says they got discouraged at the, at the sheer amount of rubble that had to be got away, all those stones and all that stuff, out of the way before they could even start the task of building. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10, Judah said the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. And um, if Nehemiah hadn't kept him going in the right direction, that wall never would have, never would have gotten build, uh, built. And so sometimes what's in front of us looks so great that we just feel, oh, we can't do this. We can't go a step further. We can't make it. Uh, and we lose our faith because of physical weakness. And that's what it was uh, back there in Nehemiah's day. It's just physically impossible to move all that rubble out of the way. Same thing happened with Elijah. Uh, after his great uh, victory uh, on Mount Carmel there in 1 Kings 18, you get into chapter 19, he's running from Jezebel. <clears throat> and in chapter 19, verse 7, it says, The angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Amen. Elijah, this this what, what you're headed for, this is just too much for you. You can't handle it. And if I don't go with you, you're not going to be able to handle it. Amen. And so the Lord took care of it, met him there, and so on. You know the story back in there. And that's our trouble a lot of times. The journey gets too great because we've got too many irons in the fire. Is that not true? Uh, God uh, prophesied through Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, in the last days they'd be running to and fro. Amen. Meaning what? You're, you're too busy to get things done properly and completely and so on. That's the case with us these days. Too many irons in the fire. Uh, could I say there's too much knowledge out there? It just blows me away. The internet does. I mean, just you, you type in one word, you might get over a million, you know, possibilities there to go to websites and all that kind of. It's crazy, absolutely insane. The journey is too great for us. 
And we'll never make it without Jesus. Amen. You'll never make it. Right. Well, even the disciples, right there in the Lord's presence, and you, you know, they're, they're taking care of the 5,000, all that business, and, and the Lord said, he says to them, apparently they were wore out. Apparently, apparently they were, the Lord says to them, uh, you need to come apart and rest a while. So they had no leisure so much as to eat. And isn't that the case in our lives sometimes? We are so, so pulled apart and so stretched and so busy and so much stuff uh, to get done. And just so many things that you're going to wish you had done and just don't have time for and all those kind of things. So uh, it's, uh, the journey is too great for us a lot of times. And uh, God, because we're, we're confronted with an impossible task, but guess what? Jesus said, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen. So he's the key to the whole thing. We've got too much on our plate. And so, and by the way, learn to say no. I'm talking to the adults, okay? Some people keep saying, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, to your parents. But adults learn to say no. If you're, if you're discovered to be one who can be called on any time and you're going to do it, you know, call on a busy person. If you want something done, don't call on a lazy, slothful person. But you have to learn to say no sometimes. Amen. You have to learn to say no. Uh, and when you get too much too much on your plate. You cannot please everybody, right? You just want to please God. So learn how to say no if you need to. Amen. Sometimes it's just impossible. Uh, when Jesus tested Philip and those feeding those uh, 5,000, you know, there's 5,000 men plus women and children, probably 15, 20,000 people there. And Jesus said, uh, you know, they've been following us around for three days. They're famished. We need to feed them. And it says in John 6, verses 5 and 6, Jesus saw a great company come unto him. Uh, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him. For he himself knew what he would do. He knew he was going to take those five loaves and two fish and feed all those people. But Philip didn't know that. And he put Philip to the test. He just said, What are we going to do? We need to feed these people. And Philip was floored. He said, You can't, 200 penny worth, uh, 200 days' salary, wouldn't buy enough bread to feed all this crap. <clears throat> he failed the test. So sometimes uh, there'll be situations in life that just mountains to us, uh, too hard to scale the mountain, uh, but God's going to put it in front of us anyway and test our faith out and see if we're going to trust Him with it. He already knows what He's going to do, but He'll to do things like that to prove us, see what we are going to do. Uh, God told Moses, remember back in chapter 3 of Exodus, Moses is... He's fearful of going down, doing what God wants him to do, go deliver the people and all that. And God says, what you got there, Moses? And he said, I just got a stick. This is a rod. You realize God used that rod to uh, um, turn the river into blood, to part the Red Sea, to cause the dust to turn into lice, to uh, hit the rock and water come forth and all that kind of stuff. What's the point? The point is, Whatever we got, God can use it to get us through whatever we're facing. We just need to trust Him with it. Amen. Amen. I mean, if He can do all that with a stick, man, what can He do with us? Amen. Trust the Lord when these demanding tasks fall all around you and it looks like it's just more than you can ever take it. You're going to, you're going to faint under the deal there. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 13, I can, do, I can do a few things through Christ. Can you? Mm. How about all things Amen. through Christ which strengtheneth me? All things, just trust in Him for it. <clears throat> and sometimes the Lord will use something odd, something peculiar, some kind of what we would think is a weird thing to, to test our faith out and try it out. Um, he did that with Simon Peter. They've been fishing all night. And these, are, these are experienced professional fishermen. Fished all night, caught nothing. Jesus said, hey, can, go, up, go back out there and throw your net on the right side of the shield. And it says in Luke chapter 5, verse 5, Peter answers, uh, he says, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll do a little bit of what you say. I'll let the net down. Singular. Jesus told him to let the nets down. And so the Lord tested him out there. And sure enough, you know the story the net filled with so many fish and God broke the net. And Peter falls down and the Lord says, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He realizes uh, that God can take care of whatever the situation might be. Uh, over there in in. First Samuel, he tells David he's going to fight. Uh, Second Samuel tells David he's going to fight the uh, Philistines, and God tells it a strange thing. We're talking about an army here, okay? He says, "You just get your troops to stand still till you're here going in the mulberry trees, and then I'll give you victory." Well, what was the going in the mulberry trees? It was the Holy Spirit moving out there to defeat the Philistine army, 
And uh, that's exactly what happened. Sometimes, I'm just saying, sometimes God will give directions that, to us. You know, is that going to really work? How about, the, how about the wall of Jericho? I mean, what, a, what could I just say reverently, what a crazy way to defeat a city. Amen. Defeat a city. It said, march around it seven times and blow the trumpet and yell. And I'll give you the victory. A no lost person would accept such a tactic in warfare. But that's what God did. It looked impossible. God said, we're going to do it. And so they marched around seven times, blew the trumpet, and the walls fell down flat, and every man went straight up in to the city from where he was standing, and they conquered the city. So uh, if it looks just totally impossible or maybe absolutely foolish, if God's in it, it will work, and he will get us through whatever it is. Uh, thirdly, there's daily temptations, and we all run into those every day. Every single day you run into temptations. Some of them are just insignificant, but they're still temptations. Okay? James 1, verses 2 and 3, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Various temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Uh, our society is full of wicked temptations. Everywhere. I don't care where you are. Billboards, bumper stickers, department stores, wherever you are. Wicked temptations are there in our society all the time. <clears throat> First Corinthians 10, 13, he says, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is what? Common. Common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So we face temptations every day. We don't even know how many a lot of times because we go through these things. You get faced with something that's not a problem for you. You just say, no, go on, and don't think twice about it. But we're facing temptations all the time, and sometimes they are serious. And we have to stay right with God and get through them. And he makes the way to escape. The Christian who yields to temptation does not look for the escape hatch. It's there. God said so. They don't look for it. Why do we sin? Because we want to. Okay? Paul said he was serving the Lord, uh, Acts 20, 19, uh, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations. He said, I'm serving the Lord, but there's many temptations along the way. And that's the way it is with us. Everyday cares, troubles, problems, mistakes, it doesn't matter. All those things test our faith. A flat tire on the highway will test your faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. A smashed finger under the hammer will test your faith. Mm -hmm. All those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Amen. But like Paul, Acts 20 verse 24, he said, none of these things move me. They won't move you if your faith is where it's supposed to be at that uh, given point in time. If our faith is in the Lord and not in ourself. Psalm 50 verse 15, God said, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Sometimes we just forget to call on him to get us through something. And sometimes we call on him and nothing seems to be happening. But we forget he's not on our schedule. Not to be patient. Paul said you have need of patience. Uh, Hebrews 2.18 says the Lord himself hath suffered being tempted. And because of that, that verse says he's able to help us when we're, when we're tempted. Able to meet our needs. He's been there. Hebrews 4.15, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points like as we are tempted, yet without sin. He's been through it all. We've studied this before. The devil only has three bags of tricks. That's all he's had since Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. That's all he still has. And Jesus was tempted at all three points. And so are we. So are we. Every sin, every kind of sin available will fit into the, one of those three categories. So he's tempted at all points, like as we are, yet without sin. He'll get us through if we will just trust him. Let me say number four. Sometimes there are devilish tactics. Satan gets in the picture a lot of times. He does it every time. I'm sure that the Lord will let him do that. Now, Paul said he had, his faith had no rest. He says because in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 5 and 6, he says because we're troubled on every side, without were fightings, within were fears. This is one of the great hymns. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us. He said, he said, outside were fearful things going on, uh, uh, inside were fearful things going on, and outside were fightings, we were having to contend with everything in the world, but God comforted us so we would not be cast down. He talks about that uh, in another passage, I think it's 2 Corinthians 4, he talks about cast down but not, not, not destroyed and so on. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, he said, 
speaking of the devil, he said, uh, the minister of Satan, messenger of Satan, buffets me. Buffeted by the messenger of Satan. Well, sometimes we are buffeted by the messenger of Satan. We don't always know who it is, just like Job didn't know who it was. But that's what happens in our lives sometimes. Why? The devil knows our weaknesses. Amen. He knows when to hit us. He knows where to hit us to get us to fall. And uh, Daniel says he wears out the saints. You ever been worn out in the spiritual race? Well, the devil does that to us. Ephesians 6, verse 12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spirits of wickedness, of the rulers of the darkness of this world, spirits of wickedness in high places. Just stay in the Word. Trust the Lord. Uh, and you won't be ignorant of Satan's devices. Also, we're not ignorant of his devices. Second Corinthians 2, verse 11. But if you don't stay in that book, you will be. And he'll attack you when he gets a chance. James 4, verses 7 and 8, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he's going to do what? Flee from you. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Keep your heart on the Lord. Trust in him. God says in Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The right hand of God's righteousness is Jesus Christ himself. Amen. He'll uphold you with himself if you'll just trust in him. So when the devil's on your back, just stay, stay right with God. He'll get you through it. Amen. He'll get you through it. Resist whatever the devil's trying to do. He was trying to destroy Job, but Job hung in there. And then number five, this is a bad one. Our te faith gets tested sometimes by what we would call delayed triumphs. Doesn't look like you're going to have a victory. Looks like it's not going to work. It's going to fall through. I mean, not much is more frustrating than to know you're doing everything right and still not working. It just looks like it's going to fall apart. Amen. Not going to turn out right. Proverbs 13, verse 12 is talking about that very thing. It says, hope deferred, that is put off, maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. We just need to work, learn to wait on the Lord and uh, not get, uh, not get uh, anxious and frustrated when things just don't seem to be working right. Remember when Lazarus died? John chapter 11. Jesus got word that his friend was sick. And he told his disciples, our friend sleepeth. And they said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he must be doing all right, he's recovering. And the Lord said, and it says, Jesus spake plainly, Lazarus is dead. And he said, I didn't go for your sakes that you might see the glory of God. And they delayed another couple of days. And so four days later, they get there. Lazarus has been buried four days now. Martha runs out, and first thing out of her mouth, she said, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had died. What she said, Lord, I know you can heal the sick and all that stuff, but I, I don't know about this business of raising the dead. I don't know if you can do that. And then Mary says the exact same words, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. And so, you know the story, he goes to the grave, rolls the stone away, says Lazarus, come forth, and out he comes. So uh, hope deferred. They sent word. Martha and Mary sent word to Jesus, your, your friend is sick, the one you love is sick, nigh unto death, would you please come quickly? And he doesn't. And Lazarus dies. And they think, my brother's dead, it's all over. Nothing can be done now. Lord, if you'd just been here. But you know what he says in effect? Well, I am here. And I am the resurrection. And you're going to see the glory of God. So sometimes we say, Lord, if you just if you would have just answered that prayer, this wouldn't have happened. Lord, why didn't you do it? Uh, work it out for me. Hope gets deferred. And we lose hope if we're not careful when that happens. Amen. We have need of patience. What is it that works patience, according to Paul? Tribulation work in patience. <laughs> So what do we have need of? But Lord, we have need of troubles in our lives, so we'll learn to be patient for you and with you. Mm. What do you say in Psalm 30, verse 5? In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. One of the songs says, Hold on, my child. Joy is coming in the morning. And then let me say lastly, there's uh, discouraging treks. What is that? Well, that's a journey. Difficult journeys. Well, those Jews in the wilderness, that was a difficult, 
difficult thing for 40 years. I, I doubt if they had a, many good days at all during that whole 40 years, all of them, uh, what they were going through and what they were facing every single day. We're going, well, we're going to sleep tonight. When we get up in the morning, we're going to have water to drink. We're going to have food to eat. We're going to be facing another enemy. What's going to happen tomorrow? Just uh, discouraging all the whole time in that 40 years. And, of course, that's the way it had to be with them. The Lord said, you're going to stand there until you drop dead because of your rejection of the Lord not following him. But sometimes it's that way with us. It's a difficult journey. For some, for some Christians, life as a whole is a difficult journey. Amen. What was it uh, last week Brother Brandon testified about the nursing home and some of those people have nobody in there. If you, if you ever preach in nursing homes, and I have, some of them have absolutely nobody. But some of those people are saved. Well, what's that? That's a child of God going through a difficult journey with nobody by their side, no friends, no family, no help. Difficult journey. And by the way, that says we need each other. Amen. No man live it to himself. As the world says, no man's an island. We need each other. And so <clears throat> sometimes our way gets real difficult. One of the songs says, this world is not my home. Thank God for that. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. So we get in, a, get in a rough time sometimes. We wonder, where is God? How long is this going to last? Am I ever going to see the light at the end of the tunnel? Numbers 21, verse 4, they journeyed from Mount Hor, that's Mount Sinai, by way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people, Israel in the wilderness. Now listen, the soul of the people was much discouraged. So much discouraged because of the way. And like I read a few minutes ago about Elijah, the angel said to him, the journey is too great for thee. And could I say, even though we might think we're macho and can tackle anything, the journey of life is too great for all of us. It's just too great. Without the Lord, you're not going to make it. So we need him every hour, not just every day. And so sometimes, just like those Jews, we're discouraged because, because of the way. Where we, where we are, what's going on. Uh, listen to Job's attitude. Job 23, verse 10. And I ask you to finish this verse a while ago. He said, Job says, He, God, knoweth the way that I take. He knows the way I'm going. And when he tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Don't you know Joshua and Caleb came forth after 40 years in that wilderness as gold? Nobody else did. They did. Canaan is not a type of heaven in the Bible. It's a type of the Christian walk, the mature Christian walk. The wilderness is a type of being back sleeping on the Lord, all that kind of stuff. Deuteronomy 11 verse 11 says the land, talking about Canaan, the land where you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys. It's a, it's a land of milk and honey, full of milk and honey, full of blessings, but it's also a land of hills and valleys valleys but we can just thank God about that first Kings 20 verse 28 says God is not only God of the hills but also God of the valleys you know that song the God of the mountain also the God of the valley the God of the day also the God of the night it gets dark and you're down in the valley he's there he's there just need to learn to trust in him Psalm 139 tells you wherever you are God is there he said, the psalmist says, if I ascend to heaven, thou art there. No, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. He said, he said, even the dark is light unto thee. So God is with us all the time. And in our Christian Canaan, our type of our Christian life, it says in Deuteronomy 11, verse 12, it's the land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. God says, he says, tells Israel there in Deuteronomy, he says, when I get you that land that flows from milk and honey, that land of Canaan, he said, that's the land I love. That's my land. And I'm going to be there with you all the time, forever. In this Christian walk, he's with us all the time, every single day, <clears throat> every day. Aren't you glad you can't get away from him? <laughs> he's always there. Peter says, 1 Peter 2, 11, we're strangers and pilgrims here. You know, this world is not my home, just passing through. Strangers here. So just like Israel in their Canaan, we can expect deferred blessings. We've been talking about some of those things a while ago. Uh, by the way, the servants don't wear the crowns. The kings do. We made kings and priests under our God. Revelation 5 verse 10 says, but that takes place in the kingdom, not now. We're serving the Lord now. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. Not only can we expect deferred blessings, we can expect all kinds of difficulties all along the way. 
difficulties. Remember that uh, prayer request Nancy put on prayer chain last week? Uh, the, the lady up there in Alabama, one of the grammar kids or grandkids, uh, just lost a baby. Well, that's difficult along the road. Difficult. One of the difficulties of life. And then there can also be discord in the camp, just like there was with Israel. You do it, you live in this Christian life, there can be discord in the camp. And one person God hates is somebody who's who sows discord among brethren. Hebrews chapter 6 tells you that. And God hates the bad. He hates upset between his children. He sets, he hates a rift going on between his kids. He hates that kind of stuff. And want to remember that we've got a problem with somebody and do what the Bible says. And if there's all, go to them, get the thing reconciled. Matthew 5 tells you. Get straightened out because God is upset when things like that go on. But there's going to be that along this journey. Discord in the camp. And not only that, but enemies in every direction. Boy, through those 40 years, Israel faced one enemy after another. They got to Moab. They said, you ain't coming to my land. We'll kill all of you. You got to Edom. Said the same thing. I faced those Amalekites and all that business, all, all that, that in the wilderness. There's enemies in every direction for us Christians. The devil is your enemy. The world is your enemy. The government is your enemy. The flesh is your enemy. We face them all the time on this, on this difficult journey. And sometimes the worst enemy at all is ourselves. Our own flesh gives us more trouble than anybody else sometimes. Amen. So, the trial of our faith comes in many ways, many colors. And it comes daily to some degree or other. God personally tries our faith. He lets the devil test us. He lets the world test us. And our own flesh will put us to the test a lot of times. And those Christians who pass the test come through as gold from the furnace. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. A few more minutes we'll be done here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul went through more than we ever will. And I mentioned that earlier in 2 Corinthians 11. But let's look in chapter 4 here and listen to what Paul has to say. Verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8. We are troubled on every side. Just about every town he went into, they threatened to kill him, put him in jail, whatever. Yet not, not distressed. We are perplexed. Sometimes we don't know what's going on, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Uh, I might uh, spiritualize what he's saying there in verse 11. You, you're supposed to die to self every day so Jesus can live through us. Verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So the same one that raised Jesus from the dead will raise us up one of these days. Verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, even the trials of our faith is for our sake to build us up in faith, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving giving of many redound to the glory of God, for, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, and he is every day perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for a light affliction. Now you know what you just read? All that stuff Paul went through, he calls it light affliction. Man, we'd, we'd be horrified by some of the things he went through. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not, here's the key, where your faith is, look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I remember we had a bunch of kids one time, took them to Eden State Park. You know, ever been there? Where that mansion is, all stuff between here and Panama City. <clears throat> And we was going through that house and big old mansion, you know, and all that uh, Victorian stuff and furniture in there. 
one of them kids said, but somebody was oohing and aahing about all that stuff, and one of them kids said, ah, it's all going to burn up one day. Well, it is. It is. Everything we see, except people, God's people, is going to be burned up. And we put our anchor in this kind of stuff instead of in the Lord Jesus. It's no wonder when you lose stuff. Back, back in, what was it, Black Tuesday in 1929 when the stock market fell, people were jumping out of windows and committing suicide. Why? Their God was their bank account. It wasn't the Lord. If people start losing things, Christians start losing things if they're not careful of it, let on God. You and God make a majority. You don't do anything else anyway if you got Him. Amen. But we have, we have trouble grasping that sometimes. God gives us grace to go through the trials of life if we allow Him to do so. And one day He's going to give us glory for having gone through those trials. Paul talks about that. No, it's not Paul. James talks about that. The, the crown of righteousness for they, those who have faced temptation and stayed right with the Lord and all that. He'll give you glory forever. And He'll say, uh, when He says, well, don't have good faith and servant, we'll be able to say like Paul, Lord, it's nothing. This is a lot of affliction. Thank you for being with me. Keep it light. I remember going through basic training there in uh, Lacan Air Force Base in Texas. Going through the, what do you call that? Um, some kind of a, what is it called? Obstacle, obstacle, obstacle course. Obstacle course. And we thought they was killing us, you know. That's, <laughs> I had that. I said this one day. He said, we, every, every three months we have the Boy Scouts out here to run that, and they run circles around you guys. <laughs> a lot of fiction, man. <laughs> Amen. That's what it is. That's what we're going to say. You ever go through a big, big uh, difficult thing, you get to the other side, look back and say, man, why was I so upset about that? Well, here's as bad as I thought while I was going through it. Galatians 6, verse 9, be not weary and well doing. For in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Paul said, uh, God has a far more exceeding way to glory for us. Hebrews 12, verses 3 and 4. Consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted under blood, striving against sin. Consider him. Think about just what Jesus went through. We haven't gone through what he went through. And we're not going to. Well, look what he faced for our sake. We're going to be able to face the little things in life. And I, I, say, I say little things. I know they're big to us when they're happening. I understand that, okay? We've had problems just like you have. We understand all that stuff. But compared to Jesus, they're not very big at all. Not very big at all. So instead of murmuring and complaining, what would it be like the Peter and John in Acts chapter 5? They were beaten. For street preaching. And said they went away rejoicing that they'd been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Mm. Do we ever do that when we go through a trial? And just rejoice in God, thank you for letting me go through that for your glory and for your sake. If faith is tried, if you stay with the stuff, you'll come through as go. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you are always with us in our trials. Lord, forgive us sometimes. We don't see that. We don't recognize that. We don't realize that. But you are with us. And if we just trust in you, and not only resist the devil, but resist our rotten flesh trying to get us to throw in the towel and quit, trying to get us to murmur and complain about our situation. God, help us just to trust you. And look unto you, the author and finisher of our faith. And consider you face such contradiction of sinners against yourself, lest we be weary. Altars open, anybody needs to come, face anything in life, you might want to talk to the Lord about it, He's there, He will meet your need, He will help you, but you've got to take a step toward Him. <coughs> no trial is too big for our God. He told the Son what time to come up this morning, He'll, he'll take care of you. facing anything in particular, but you might just want to pray, Lord, when something does come my way, please help and stay right with you.